Honey. Hey, it's now Spencer, this is us, and you're tuned in to Angie B. It's your boy Roshan, I'm tuned in with Angie B on the beat, baby. Hey guys, I'm Alexander Ship, and you're tuning in to Angie B. I'm the Spike Lee, and I'm with Angie B on the beat. You're tuning in to Angie B. You know, you're tuning in to Angie B on the beat. The beautiful Angie B. Well, my experience here at the American Black Film Festival starts off with, should I wear this or no. you good? Okay, I'm good. Okay, I, I love how you just, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really starts, and it, it, it's funny because it starts off back in Mexico. Yeah, uh, Jeff Friday, a great friend of mine for years and years prior to all of this. Um, when I was doing Def Comedy Jam at the beginning, Jeff was like, damn Bob, this is like really, really cool. And we need to do something with the comedians over like in Cancun, right? And we went there and Jeff put this thing together called the Island Hopper uh, Comedy uh, cl uh, Show whatever it was called, and I brought a bunch of the comedians from Def Comedy Jam who wasn't really known at the time, uh, along with Kid Capri. You know, we went over there and we did this thing, and it was pretty cool, but it was a whole lot of other things going on, and when we were able to bring Kid Capri over there, a lot of people like jumped on him, knowing he yeah, so he's doing. So Jeff was like, man, I, I need to do something else. Right. Right? So Jeff had, he was, he was um, switching, um, not really, I wouldn't say he was switching professions, but just lanes within his profession because he's like a marketing genius, right. you know? So he decided that he was looking at uh, what was going on with blacks in Hollywood, and he felt like they were being underserviced, but they were being, like, certain ones were being used, but nobody really had a way of finding, like, how can they all come together and make you know, make things happen, as well as the aspiring artists, you know? So he decided to do this um, festival in Acapulco, Mexico, called the Acapulco Black, I mean, yeah, the Acapulco Black Film Festival, and um, ABFF. So it, it took off, but it took off like slowly, but again, you hear sometimes the quickest way, I heard my man and Tony say the quickest way, the fastest way to get to where you're going is doing it slowly, you know, walking slowly. So that's kind of like what Jeff did, but then it took, like all of a sudden Denzel Washington showed up, Morgan Freeman showed up, and Halle Berry showed up. And you know, if Halle was there, the guys wanted to be there. And it was like, if Denzel was there, the women wanted to be there. And then it was just a, it was a snowball effect. So we just had a ball there. And I was already doing the comedy thing. So I started bringing the Cheryl Underwoods, the Tommy Davidsons, the Earthquakes, the J.B. Smooths, and um, John Wilson. It was like a lot of different comedians coming through there. So that was the beginning of it all for me. And um, here I am. Now in Miami, 23 years later. Well, with me, it took, it took 25 years of me being in the cut, in the background, for a lot of people to realize that I had such a major influence on so many of, you know, the top comedians of the world, um, their, their their careers, as well as some people behind the scenes. I, you know, I was, the, you know, I jump started them, and it, it it's like the kids who are 25 years old, 30 years old, they really had no idea of you know my what I've done, but they see how I've gone about it. You know what I mean? And this is not about glamour and glitz. 
You know what I mean? This is about sacrifice and paying your dues, you know, volunteering to do things. And um, I think that today's um, uh, generation need to just understand that there were some people that fought for you to get where you are now. And it's a little easier for um, today's generation, the millennials and what have you, because of social media and things of that nature. You can basically create your own platforms now. But um, with, with that being said, um, I just I just I just want to want to take today's youth and give them an opportunity to learn from somebody who has gone through it and understand that it just doesn't happen overnight. So, I love that. That's what's up. That's I think that's exactly what we need to learn in this generation. It's very frustrating um, just to see people talk about like. Your generation wants into gratification all the time. Like, no, some of us really do, you know, work hard and we really do want to grind in the paint and in the cut. So I think as a kid, it was already in me. My, I come from a musical background. My uncle is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was the lead singer for um, a 50s group called The Platters. You know, my mom worked at RCA Records. My brother was a musician. My other brother was a singer. You know, and I just started DJing. I was the first uh, DJ actually in a in a comedy club. That's how I had Kit Capri DJ for Def Def Comedy Jam. So I always been around it. I was a basketball player. I was an athlete who, after the games, I would have parties, and me and my boy Eric, we would like take two like old turntables and without a mixer, but we would have all of the latest records, and we would charge like a quarter to get into the parties. Like I was always about. It. You know, so there was never a time that I didn't feel like I would be doing what I'm doing. However, ultimately, ultimately, as I, you know, went from Deaf Comedy Jam to now I have my brand called Laugh Mob, which the acronym for Mob is more of Bob's best. It's as simple as that. But I wanted to take a page out of Mr. Barry Gordon's book, and I wanted to create a platform or a corporation, an entertainment corporation, where I can actually have a building where all of my friends and some family, I, you know, he did it, you know, with a love. You know, sometimes your family could be the ones that really kick you in the back. It happened to me, and it woke me up, just like the car thing. You know, I, it's something I won't even go into, maybe in the documentary. But I wanted to create something for my friends who I know I went to college with, who they may do in different things. So, but you need those things to run a corporation. So if they want to get in the entertainment business or whatever, if they, the attorney, the, the CPA, whatever, they all are my people, okay? But they have a, a building where they can go to work, get paid like you're supposed to get paid. But, uh, you know, you even the custodian, it'll be like my, my man. You know what I mean? But he got a job and he has his guys that work under him. I would love to have that at the end of the day and continue to put out quality entertainment. You know, I started in music and then I fell into television and now I'm moving into some other areas and some real cool stuff. So that's where I want to be. I just want to be still doing like Quincy Jones and Clarence A. Bond. That's good stuff. I was telling somebody the other other day that although there were black comedians that preceded Def Comedy Jam, you, it wasn't in bunches. It was in little, you know, little packs or whatever the case may be. And because of my uh, lineage, I guess you call it, of being around black comedians as a kid, I knew that, you know, there had to be a, a place where they started. And most of them started kind of like in, in bars and speakeasies, whatever the case may be. And I wanted to create a, um, a place where they can all come and work on their material and stuff because when you took one or two of them and they was trying to get into the mainstream rooms, they couldn't get directly on stage. They would have to wait till the main shows was over. They would have to pick numbers and hopefully they would get on and stuff like that. So I wanted to create a situation and because I knew that 
North New Jersey was a hotbed, like the Red Foxes and the Flip Wilsons. They used to play those bars around there, including the Jackie Gleasons used to come and get material and stuff from these guys. I said, let's let's figure this out. So I started doing this comedy room in a place called Terminal D in North New Jersey. And I said, wow, when you look at it in, in retrospect, me being the DJ in there with the hip hop flavor coming from Def Jam Records. I was working at Def Jam Records at the time. I just started actually. And I said, wow, what I was able to do for the birth of death or the comedy, hip hop comedy, whatever, however you want to do, is similar to what Cool Herc did in the Bronx with actually hip hop music, you know? So I'm like kind of thinking that the real comedy movement started in Nook, and it started with, you know, me. So, as I'm working at Def Jam Records, I'm doing what I have to do to tr try to, I didn't just come in there to be working at Def Jam Records, I, I always try to, I'm a leader, I'm an Aquarius, and uh, I, um, I'm, I'm Jackie Robinson, Rosa Parks, Michael Jordan, Oprah Winfrey, Bob Marley, Jim Brown. We are all leaders, if you just understand, Alicia Keys. You know, we, it's a thing about us. And, and I'm just following that, Chris Rock, we all, we know we do what we do. So, with that being said, I um, saw, you know, I was doing this thing and then as I was making moves as an assistant to the president, I knew everything about how to run a record company because I had to know what every division, you know, what they covered from artist development to, you know, every, every, everything, you know, A&R, you know, and, um, but back then, they just gave me the keys to the car. You know what I mean? Because I had already developed relationships with Steve, with Bill Bellamy, with Joe Torre, uh, who else was I working with at the time? I, I knew of like the Bernie Mac and, and Adele Gibbs. Like it was like I knew how to do the pilot. We was given two shows, 10 comedians, and two shows turned into 104. You know what I'm saying? With so many people that come from the show, so. That is beautiful. And it's it's great that every time a comedian, you know, is in an interview like this, or if they're talking to a crowd, they always bring up, okay, you know, I got my start at, you know. Is it, I mean, most, yeah. I mean, it's nice. It's really nice to hear that, but I don't ask. I'm a very, I don't, because I've been in the business for so long, the other way, being in the family that's been around, and my other uncle played for the New York Yankees. You know what I mean? Willie Randolph is a got about six rings, you know, coaching and playing. So I'm like, I've been around it, so I ain't beat. You know, I'm not beat, I'm just trying to see people win. I love that. So all win. Yes, oh my gosh, I say that all the time. I cry, because I really believe that in my heart that everybody has a place and everybody has a purpose. You seem to say a lot of things <laughs> that I say. I'm telling you. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about Laugh Bob. I thought about comedy, I thought about family, I thought about Motown. I wanted to build something that was in my lane, which was what I was able to do when Russell and Stan gave me the keys to, you know, drive this laugh mob mobile. Chris Tucker, Ricky Smiley, Tracy Morgan, Cheryl Underwood. I said Greg Robinson. Greg Robinson. So many of them, besides the kings and queens of comedy, Dave Chappelle, they all airy spears. Like I can go on and on, but nobody, I found them. You know, they were doing what they were doing in different places, but I, I was able to give them a platform through Stan and Russell to let, you know, do this thing. And a lot of people would have tried to still do it. Kevin Hart talks about it in his book when he won a contest that I had back in 96 and 97, Mike Epps. You know, it just goes on and on some more. Like I said, the so it got to like, it's nine, it's 2000, whatever. Nobody has done this thing because nobody has that formula. I have the formula. So I wanted to create a brand. So why not? Had bring my more Bob's best. 
here comes Laugh Mob. So what are we gonna do with it? We don't know, but we sure enough gonna find out. Let's go back to ABFF again. ABFF, I decided with the Laugh Mob brand to go to Philadelphia. All right, this is gonna tie into so much. It's crazy. I decided to go to Philadelphia with my partner, Arthur Spivak, from uh, LA by way of Chicago. He was managing a, a guy named uh, Paul Reiser. Paul had a show called Mad About You. Arthur retired. Then a comedian, Red Brand, told me about this guy, Arthur, and he was like, uh, Red was saying, Bob, you need to come out to LA. And I had been thinking about it because I knew that I had done so much on the East Coast building that Def Jam brand. So all of those names that I mentioned earlier, I said, I believe I have the form, I can do it again. I know how to do this thing. We decided to identify who I felt were the hottest comedians. I'm, here I am back doing Hollywood. We're gonna identify who are the hottest comedians who may have a 30 minute set or a hour set. Tape them, give them a quality tape and possibly Showtime or somebody will pick it up, right? So here I am, I'm treating comedy like it's a Thanksgiving turkey, okay? So here's the first part of that turkey. We're gonna shoot these shows in Philadelphia. We're gonna have this content. We're gonna see who gets picked up, okay? Now, we're gonna play with this a couple different ways, but what do you do with all that audio, that content of all those hours that didn't get picked up? You take the best audio of jokes that tell a story, okay? You pull those out, okay? And you mold them into comedy videos. Two of the guys who worked with me, they had started out with me as production assistants on Def Comedy Jam, but I just saw that they had so much going for them, right? They took these things and they put together one video called Laugh it was called um, Fruit Loops with Red Grant, and we got 60 million views. Oh, wow. And it just went on and on. But I also like to tell you that the brother who had filmed my specials in Philadelphia was his first time ever directing stand up comedy. But I knew that he could do it because his mentor was my, my mentor, Stan Lathan. But along that same line with Laugh Mob, I'm down here at the ABFF maybe five, six years ago, and I took a DVD of excerpts from the Philadelphia shooting because I wanted to do like Barry Gordy. A lot of people be wondering, where did you get all this grainy footage from back in the day before they became stars? That's what I did on this DVD. So there's comedians like Laurel on there, Carlos Miller from Wild and Outs on there, and a few others, right? And the trip is, I'm going into one of the ABFF parties, and I hand, because I'm just out here like I'm a street team, I'm a hustler, you know what I mean? So I tell you, I'm from, you know, it's two ways to play this thing. So, dude says, wait a minute, Bob Sumner, Def Comedy Jam, who's Bob Sumner? You know, I said, I'm Bob Sumner. He said, man, I'm supposed to meet you. I'm Ty Johnson from Aspire TV. We need to meet in the morning. I meet him in the morning with the general manager. Next thing you know, I have a TV show with all clean comedy on Aspire called Laugh Mobs We Got Next. I'm like, it all starts here at the American Black Film Festival. Crazy, right? I spoke on Tiffany Haddish, right? And I spoke on Black Panther, okay? Here's the common denominator between Tiffany Haddish and Black Panther, because Tiffany Haddish was not in Black Panther, right? Right. 
However, Tiffany Haddish was in a movie called Girls Trip. Tiffany Haddish is a young lady that I identified years ago and had her on Def Comedy Jam. People saw her on the Def Comedy Jam 25 and it was like, wow, that was her. That was 2007. It took that long for people to realize who she was. And no one realized who she was, who recognized her. No. I had been there. But a man who was baptized at the Acapulco Film Festival. His name is Will Pat. Girls Trip. Tiffany Haddish. American Black Film Festival. Will Pat. Okay? Wakanda. Big movie. Highest gross. You know who was the director? Man named Ryan Coogler. Know where I met Ryan Coogler? The American Black Film Festival. <laughs> know who it knew who Ryan Coogler was? Nobody. Know where they found out who he was? American Black Film Festival. The point I'm making is what you was just saying. People come here and this is where they become stars. You know, we say at the Apollo Theater, where stars are born and where legends are made. I think, I think the American Black Film Festival can take a piece of that too. I want to thank you so much, Bob Sumner, for being welcome. just so open with us and just being so upfront with everything you do with the National and Organic. And I really thank do you. appreciate you. Can you let the people know that you're tuning in to NGV on the beat? Hi, this is Bob Sumner. Some people call me the star maker, and I just want you to know that you're tuning into Angie B on the beat.